Edward Grimes' experience in the National Forest of Pennsylvania is a disturbing one. He believes he was being stalked by something that was not a bear, something far more intelligent, larger, and had the intentions of potentially hurting him. But before we get into today's stories, make sure you go ahead and slap that subscribe button down below because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural. Let's do it. Edward's story is quite the interesting one. He had an experience he wished to share with me located in central Pennsylvania around the Susquehannock National Forest. This was back in 2018 when they went on a hiking trip with a close friend to whom they've been buddies with for a long time. First, a little bit about Edward's background. He proclaims to be a very avid outdoorsman and a seasoned veteran hiker. He's been all around the country and has a personal goal of hiking at least 100 miles a year. He's also certified in first aid. His experience is as follows. Him and his friend began their hike around 10 a.m. It was a beautiful day and the weather was great. They were walking through dense forest with occasional clearings here and there between thickets of trees and bushes. The area, they say, is very remote, with no houses or roads for miles around them. He says that he felt something off from the start, but didn't want to alarm his friend, so he shut his mouth. After about an hour of hiking, they came across a small clearing where they could see pretty far into the distance because of how high up they were on this hillside terrain. As they stood there, this open space, just looking at the scenery, Edward noticed a dog moving behind some brush, maybe 50 or so yards away to the right side, which is northeast if you're standing where he was looking. What Edward noticed immediately that was slightly off-putting was that the shape that they believed to be a dog was much larger than they had initially noticed. Completely confused by this, they began watching more intently. Edward and his friend, to whom he never gave a name, were completely unsure of what they were looking at. At this time of year, the brush was rather dense and made it hard to see what they were looking at. Whatever it was was very large, and Edward even admitted that they both suspected they were looking at a huge black bear within a few moments. And then, it suddenly stops and appears to stand up on its hind legs. Again, because the brush and undergrowth obstructed their full view, they can only see parts of this animal. And this went on for several moments as they're watching this thing move effortlessly in the thick undergrowth when Edward's friend began to take notice of something more ominous. Edward quickly began to feel it too. Something was watching them. Within less than a moment, they both had the horrible realization of what was happening. They were being stalked by something. Edward went on to detail how he began to feel the hair on the back of his neck and arms stand on end as they could feel several pairs of eyes glaring at them. Looking around, however, they could see no such eyes. He and Edward's friend were stuck in this moment of what he described as feeling like infinity. He knew that being in this moment of danger meant they needed to leave the area now. But he was also afraid that something would strike him from the tree line if he left or even moved his body an ounce. Growing enough courage, Edward and his friend began to move out of the clearing back towards the way they came, and as they did this, their suspicions were validated. Both began to hear movements of something weighty deep in the wood lines on both sides. Edward recalls hearing deep, raspy breathing that reminded him of his own grandmother, who'd been a longtime smoker and died of emphysema. He noted that whoever, or whatever the lungs belonged to, were very large, which in turn meant the animal was enormous. They began to hasten their pace as whatever these figures in the tree line began following them. Now, at this point in the story, Edward has made no mention that they believe this to be a Bigfoot or anything that could not be rationally explained. They were both terrified because if this was a black bear, the behavior was so out of character and bears don't hunt in packs either. Not to mention the raspy breathing sounds that were unmistakably a result of bellows coming from an animal. Now, according to Edward, they could hear the tree limbs snapping and breaking as... Whatever was following them stalked them through the forest. At one point, 
Edward is certain he possibly saw a set of eyes peering at him from a tree as they passed by too quickly for him to make sure. What he says most made them uncomfortable was the sheer size of these animals. If it was large bear, they were huge. So they made their way back and the sounds behind them seemed to fade completely as they did. The entire way back though, even as the monsters faded, or monsters, right? It could be bear. The forest went completely silent. Usually only happens when large predators are going through an area. And the entire way back, they felt as if whatever this was, assuming again it was a bear, wanted them out of its territory. Afterward, Edward made sure his friend was okay and that he would never tell the full experience in public for fear of being ridiculed. But after some coaxing, he said that whatever it was, he believed it was Bigfoot. However unlikely that may seem to some people, this area has a history of weird occurrences, from UFOs and strange lights in the forest and even open habituation of creatures. Edward admits that if it was a black bear they saw that day, the behavior patterns of whatever was following them in the woods just did not make any sense. He claims the animals know when humans are there and make their presence known, or they disappear in a blink of an eye, leaving only the sounds of movement and breath to be heard. After talking to Edward Moore, I learned that people have claimed to see a very tall, upright, carnivorous-like being near the same forest in Pennsylvania. Perhaps this is what they encountered that day. Could a case like this be considered an encounter? I don't know, but as I have said in several of my previous videos, black bears seem to be a go-to explanation for many Bigfoot sightings. If this was a case of misidentification, how do we explain them being stalked in the woods by two other animals that were also equally as large? Or is it possible that Edward and friend just saw a huge black bear from a distance, which they misidentified as a canine? Any two animals stalking both of them was just as coincidental that it coincided with the black bear misidentification. I brought this up to Edward and he admitted that while he doubted it was a Bigfoot at first, several things led him to believe that this was not a black bear. The sounds in the woods going quiet, how they were followed for a time as if being driven out of a territory. It seemed far too aggressive for some gang of black bears to drive Edward and his friend out. But truth is often stranger than fiction. What do you guys think of this story? Taylor's story is one of disturbing proportions as her account details what it was like to come face to face with strange beings while camping out near the Chillisquaki in Pennsylvania. At the time of this story, Taylor was 24, an avid camper and hiker. Before the story, she had been on several camping trips and several adventures in the great outdoors, specifically near Chillisquaki, but was still relatively new to the Pennsylvanian wilderness. What she had encountered to this point were small game and wild boar, and had even thought to have seen some strange animals in the distance, but nothing of this magnitude. This is her story. Taylor had been excited to go venture off east of Chillisquaki, deeper into the woods, this time to a spot she had never camped near, Montour Ridge. She was scouting for new locations away from the crowds and experiences prior. She found solace near a small tributary that led into the west branch of the Susquehanna River. It wasn't a wrong camping spot, but close to civilization that if anything went awry, she would be able to call and be picked up. Taylor much preferred the safety of camping somewhere that was relatively close to civilization. She had some pretty sticky situations happen in the middle of nowhere, with 10 miles plus to get to civilization. She's not a fan of getting stuck where it's hard to reach people. Anyway, the evening went pretty well. Everything was expected. But as the sun began to set, she would feel these strange tingling sensations all over her body as if she was close to an electrical current. While she did think this was strange, she never was quick to write this off as something eerie or unsettling, or dare I say, Fordian. As she began to grow tired, she would then retire to her tent. Pretty normal up to this point. Now, this is where things get a little crazy. During the night, she is woken by a strange noise right outside her tent. She recalled this noise as there was loud, muffled construction within 50 yards of her tent. A very loud mechanical humming seeming to grow in intensity and sounded as if it was quickly moving towards her tent. 
from the time she woke up to when this noise began to erupt around her and move quickly towards her was probably only 5 to 10 seconds max. At the moment, she described it as lasting for several minutes as she tried to decipher and discern the noise source. The next thing she knew, she was engulfed in this blinding white light where she felt it disoriented and she was floating in the air. She described that the next thing she felt was sitting on this steel slab with what she recalled were these strange gray beings standing around her, looking down at her. She said feeling the worst fear you could ever feel. In fact, to me, she related it to when you get a jump scare. And in that split second where you're all the way up here and then you feel that fear, that's what it was like the entire time. She began screaming due to being restrained somehow. Even though she said physically and visually, she could see nothing actually restraining her. It's as if her muscles simply refused to cooperate. One of these beings, in reaction to her trying to break out of her invisible restraints, slowly lifted its arm and hand and placed its fingers on her chest, over her heart. And that moment, she began to feel immense pain in her chest, equivalent to having an intense heart attack where she began to lose breath and fell unconscious. She recalls other points during this event where she could not open her eyes but was conscious and would feel these burning, prodding pains all along her body, like somebody was taking a searing piece of steel and sticking her skin with it. She described this going on for hours at a time to when she eventually lost consciousness for the final time. She awoke in her tent with the sun just barely rising, wholly traumatized by what had transpired the night before. However, with no signs of disturbance to her or her tent, she wondered if it was genuinely a vivid nightmare. However, she actually found that she had minor burn marks on her arms and legs that were not there the night before. Her chest also hurt something fierce, as if something heavy had been pushed against it for a long time. She even reported that she had breathing issues for about a week after, and it constantly felt as if something heavy was sitting on her chest. The burn marks located on her arms and legs eventually disappeared within the following week as if they had never existed. And the following day, she believed that what had happened to her was genuine and not just a nightmare. She recalls the horrific events of what they did to her, and no nightmare is that realistic. She informed me that at this time, she was ignorant to other alien abduction stories and didn't believe in that. But this was her turning point. It wasn't until she began researching herself that she began to see other similarities between cases. And she was confident from here that what she had experienced was an encounter with these strange demonic beings intent on hurting and torturing her. To this day, she has told me that I am the only person that she has shared this story with because her family would make fun of her. Ted and his 19-year-old son in 2003 had a very bizarre experience they can't quite explain. The morning started like any other on a beautiful day in April in Skullkill. Ted and his 19-year-old son set off around the Blue Mountain Fishing Lakes area around Skullkill. One thing that Ted made a note of immediately upon getting out of the car was a strange odor in the air, one that was full of stink and it reminded him of a cross between a carcass and a thunderstorm. However, the sky was clear because there was no indication of bad weather coming. As Ted claimed, they spent the morning there and did not catch much due to not bringing their lucky fishing rods, he informed me. But the entire time they fished, they could not shake the feeling that there was just something off. Now, they ignored it, and after a few hours, Ted's son, whom he never told me the name of, admitted that he had been uncomfortable the entire time too and picked up on something being off. But again, they could not put a finger on what it was. Often, Ted would be hearing this loud ringing noise coming from the distance that seemed to almost infiltrate his eardrum and brain. He also noted that the area is generally a pretty popular fishing spot and was shocked to see barely anybody else around. However, he did not equate this to any of the events that occurred this day. It was just indifferent to the situation. After a few more hours, they decided to pack up and head home. As Ted started the car, he noticed that it was running extremely rough, like something was wrong with the engine. But there were no warning lights on or anything, so he just shrugged it off as one of those things that happens sometimes with cars. And after driving for a few miles and the car seemed fine, 
He was getting ready to turn when his son said they were being followed. Ted looked in the rearview mirror and sees this large black SUV behind them. He thought that it was just some people who were also out enjoying the day and decided to keep going. However, after driving for a few more moments, his son began to panic and said something strange. Dad, I think they're following us, he told his dad, Ted. Ted looked in the rearview mirror and sure enough, the SUV was still there. He decided to take a few more random turns through a neighborhood, go through some side streets, and again, they're still there behind them. So at this point, Ted realizes that something is very wrong and he pulls over into an empty parking lot, puts his car in park, and turns the car off. The black SUV drives slowly up into the parking lot and parks and just stops. And it's just sitting there. And now Ted's car has been sitting here for several minutes. There's no movement, no noise coming from inside the SUV. Ted and his son are freaking out. Ted quickly began reaching for his firearm near his seat for fear that something bad is going to happen. His 19-year-old son was now ridden with anxiety. After a moment, or what felt like an eternity, two men in suits exited the SUV and approached Ted's driver's side window. Now, Ted described these men's odd and erratic behavior, and I personally questioned his details and even brought up the possibility that they could have been men in black. He says they looked pretty ordinary, and as I began describing the physical features of men in black, he quickly shut that down and told me they did not act robotic or even look strange. He almost wondered if they were actually part of a mafia of some kind. They began asking Ted really strange questions and made notes that they saw that he had been spending time at the lake. Too long, specifically. Ted, who was getting annoyed with playing 20 questions, began to respond aggressively. He was feeling threatened, and I don't blame him. He wasn't sure who these mysterious men were. And finally, he demanded to know who the hell are you, to which they both smirked and told Ted to have a nice day. They'll be watching. And just like that... They both got back in the SUV, pulled up onto the main road, and disappeared. Shortly after this, Ted began finding letters in his mailbox with no return address. The letters appeared strange and appeared to be written in almost code, he described. A lot of it appeared gibberish, but there were sentences like, We are watching you, and you spend too much time around Blue Mountain Lake, and other things like, We were sent to monitor what you know. After receiving a handful of these letters over the following month, Ted thought this had gone on too long and reported it to the police. The police were not sure what to make of the letters, and after that, it seemingly stopped altogether. Ted has no idea even to this day what they were trying to hide at the Blue Mountain Fishing Lakes area, but wonders if there is a direct correlation between the unsettling feeling and strange odor that he and his son experienced on that day to what would happen later on. Whoever these people were seemed to know that he had spent time here and was trying to drive him away from the area actively. This story is incredibly strange, and personally, I'm not sure what to make of it myself. It does sound reminiscent of a Men in Black story where an individual is accosted for information they know, but also different at the same time. If this was potentially a Men in Black situation, what is it that Ted and his son knew that it was so threatening to these men? And most importantly, why did they experience the strange phenomenon they did when they arrived at the lake that day? What resided there that day that was so mysterious that these men wanted to hide so much? We have so many questions and very few answers. The Allegheny National Forest is incredibly vast. It spans the north central portion of the state of Pennsylvania. It is just as wild and mysterious as the Appalachian. Or if you live up north, they call it the Appalachian. While many people go missing every year, one of the strangest cases is that of Edward Jewett. Edward disappeared from his home in Whitehead Hill, located in the portion of Warren County. Edward was a man in his 70s described as frail and small. He was a very friendly and sweet old man and was adorned with a gray beard. He was the type of person that practically had no enemies because he was so well received by his peers. He lived with his wife in a small log cabin just a short distance from his son Enoch. He spent a lot of time visiting with nearby neighbors and socializing so he was pretty well known in his community. Edward also had a dog, Jerry, that was practically his shadow. It was ubiquitous for Edward to go on daily walks with Jerry, following him everywhere. The day of his disappearance was not any different. It was a day in early spring, late in the afternoon. 
Edward had stepped outside with his wife, later claiming he never put on his coat or the dog following him outside. It's not likely that Edward had just wandered off by himself, and since he needed assistance walking, which is why he had the cane, his family and friends couldn't believe that he would have made it more than one mile. After some time had passed, an unknown amount of time, a search had finally begun for Edward and in the mountain range surrounding his tiny cabin. It was a rather large group, consisting of 90 men, divided into groups of 10. The forest around his log cabin home was searched, checking every nook and cranny, hollow tree, and crevice. Fortunately, there were no open wells, creeks, or mines that would give Edward the possibility of falling into and hurting himself. One thing that's very strange is that at this time, there was still snow on the ground, but virtually no trace of Edward's tracks could be found anywhere. Indeed, if he had wandered off in the woods, they would surely find his tracks. There is suspicion that there was a conflict between Enoch and his father, but it's all hearsay. Is it possible he was grabbed, murdered, and disposed of, or, like many of the others who just vanished without a trace, did he somehow wander off where nobody would find him? It seems as though he had just stepped off the face of the earth, disappearing off into eternity. There are no answers as to whatever truly happened to Edward Jewett in Pennsylvania. If you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and slap that like button and leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. Also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button and your notification bell so YouTube will let you know every time I release a great new piece of content. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next video.